oriented development. And that is something that most cities are now saying they want. It's, you don't have to win this policy. Everybody can see it. Build around your railways. When you do, you get 50% less car use in those areas. And uh, people have 20% more household income. This is American figures uh, because they have one less car. Vancouver has, has done a number of uh, TODs around their, their SkyTrain system. Uh, but in most local governments, you have this problem, oh dear, we don't want density here. Yeah, we like the idea, but, but not here. And uh, you have that reaction that you have to manage. And it's always, this is what they picture, this kind of density. But it doesn't have to be. You can make it look good. You can make uh, a future where you have TODs that are really attractive for people. This is one in Perth, and Subiaco is another one, uh, where you have medium density development that has changed the culture in Perth because it does look good. And even one at 35 kilometres out of the city where you say, oh, it's too far out to build densely. But you can do it. You can make TODs anywhere. We've got people from the city of Joondal up here who can talk about that. POD is pedestrian-oriented development. There's Anthony Pearl on his bicycle riding through Vancouver. There are many cities that are, uh, can claim to have good pedestrian facilities, and it is often something that has to be negotiated as part of development. In Vancouver, they, uh, they have a social infrastructure part of, of most development decisions that can be negotiated with the community. And most of the cities that have built good rail systems, like in Portland, are now trying to build around them. Perhaps the best Australian story is in Melbourne, where over a 10-year period, uh, under the tutelage of young Gale from Denmark, uh, the city has been transformed. The moving people downtown has been dramatically increased. New street trees have gone in. Uh, and every time, it's, it's a much better looking city. And Outdoor cafes have grown dramatically and new life in the laneways has, has become a feature, a, a tourist attraction as well as for the locals. The data show pedestrian traffic's gone up 40% and in the evenings 100% and stationary activities doubled and tripled. So these kind of data can now be kept and they show dramatic exponential increases. These are the trends that we should be um, showing and indicating that there is some hope. It is about imagination. It is about changing your perception of how an urban environment can be and creating a different future around that. God is green-oriented development, and it's quite simply a necessary part of the buildings that we now make them as green as possible. CH2 in Melbourne and uh, this new green building in Edmonton are examples of, of what uh, can be done. Now, if you looked at it and did all the best you could with, with transit, what, how much can you expect to change travel patterns? Most people can just see a few percent, and yet we've got to get 50 to 80 percent. This is what we need to do. But our data shows that you can actually bring dramatic change, especially if you do Todd, Pod and God at the same time. And the, the reason for that is this graph. The, there is an exponential relationship between car use and public transport use. So if you take people out of cars and put them into public transport, it actually is not a one-to-one -one relationship, not a simple linear thing. You can get six to seven times as much reduction in, in uh, car use with, uh, with one new passenger kilometre of rail use. It's, it's a bit hard to imagine, but it is part of the, um, uh, what is now called transit leverage. There's an example here from Sydney, but if you followed that graph and you double the, the uh, public transport use, you triple, uh, and more so, the amount of a reduction in car usage. What about then the other 50% of the VKT? I have become a supporter of cars. I never thought I'd say that, but it's a supporter of electric vehicles because electric vehicles offer us something that nothing else can do. 
They enable a city to become 100% renewable. It's, it's a new set of technologies. It's about the lithium-ion battery, which is quite remarkable in its, uh, its power, its efficiency, its light weight, and it is meaning that all these vehicles, the electric buses, electric cars, electric scooters and so on, can now tap into renewable energy and we can store the power in batteries so that we can do developments like this. This is a new development in, in Perth, a very big one, 10,000 dwellings, which is going to be carbon free. You can only do that if you can have this link between a smart grid, electric vehicles and renewable energy. And this is the combination that suddenly becomes available. It works like this. You fill up at night, costs you about a dollar Australian to fill up a car. During the day, when you drive your car, you plug it in. And during the day, it becomes, the battery becomes available to the utility. So it's very smart. It feeds back into the system as the peak is going up and it can enable you to have enough left to go home. It's all a matter of programming and, and this kind of approach enables a very different city to emerge. So you need plug-in parking. I notice that uh, you already have it in Edmonton. It's uh, obviously because it gets a bit cold here. Um, but smart meters and plug-in parking will be part of local government agenda. And the renewable city uh, can provide power when and where it is needed. It is mu much smarter, much more efficient, and with no oil for transport. But you still need smart centres. You cannot just fix up the cars and say, they'll all be electric, that's enough. We have to do the other part. And the interesting thing is there is new light rail technology which doesn't need the overhead catenary. It also runs on lithium ion batteries and it can link into a power source when it reaches each of the stations, this contactless power. And that means that at each of the stations, we should be building what are called smart centres that enable us to have these uh, battery-based LRTs uh, at, at its core. Finally, the, uh, there are, if you think I'm talking too much technology, there are lots of simple things that can be done now, and a number of cities have these examples. We've got one called Living Smart, based on Travel Smart, uh, where water, energy, waste, and travel have been trialled with 30,000 households. They show they can save 1.5 tons of greenhouse gases, very simply providing people with options and showing them how to do it. And uh, it's very little investment at all. So things like uh, uh, travel smart with walking school buses can happen very quickly. We need infrastructure, we need lifestyle packages, we need carbon trading packages, and together we can dramatically change everything. There's only one place I've seen that does it all, and that's in Vorban in Freiburg. There are probably others, but this is the only one I know. And it is an extraordinary place because it is exporting renewables to the grid and it is um, basically an eco-village with, with car-free housing, good light rail and bikes, the solar collector on top of the garage, the one garage, no doubt this will be a plug-in garage soon, uh, it means that the rest of the streets are free uh, without needing to build for cars. And you save 30% of the land area from bitumen and can create these beautiful environments. Lots of food growing, lots of places for, for parents with kids. And what I notice most of all, the kids are feral. There is a freedom there. So it is quite possible to imagine a green city, one where we solve these massive problems that are facing us, but they are also better cities to live in. Thanks very much.